Grace and peace, Jesus Christ to you. It's a great joy to be here again, worshiping God's name and the Lord's day with his people. It's good to have um, Tiago's parents here. I met them, Paulo and Neide, uh, this week. Noides and Vanessa. We have our friends Reginaldo, Vanessa, uh, Isabelle, and Tabata, correct? And they have a friend here, too. Uh, it's good to be here. It's, it's good. I would like you to, ask you to ask you to open your Bibles to Mark chapter 4. We will finish chapter 4 uh, today. We will read verses 35 through 41. And then we will um, pray and invite the children to come. Okay? Mark 4, 35. This is the word of God. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, and uh, so that the boat were, was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. They woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Let's pray. Lord, we, we come to you, Lord, to your word. We ask you, Lord, that you would give us illumination through the Holy Spirit to understand what is saying here. That we would finish today here, Lord, this time of worship in awe of your greatness, in awe of your majesty, and that we would say, who is this man? We would be learning from the word, Lord, today, in Jesus' name. Amen. Kids, can you, can you come here? And today I'd like to ask, to ask, um, Fathers to come here all as well. Yes. We also have Gabi here. There is now I I wanted fathers to come here because God, God gave us the responsibility as fathers to pastor our families. And it is a great responsibility. We, we have the responsibility to lead them to the word, to say, we're going this way, we're going in that direction to worship the Lord. So I wanted that to emphasize that having the fathers here, we know that it is a great work. And we know that the Lord works in our hearts. But when the father, when your father comes and say, we're going to Walmart today, what will happen? We will go. You will go, right? Yeah. Who's driving? Yeah. Your dad, right? Who's paying for that? Your dad. 
What if there's a flat tire on the way? What happens? Who's going to change that? You, Cole? No. Amanda? Okay, Joy, right? No. No, it's not Joy. It's your dad, right? No. It is the one who is responsible, who is leading the way, correct? Yes. In the text that we saw today, Jesus said, let us go to the other side, right? What happens? Will they go or not? Yes. Who is helping them? Jesus. What if there is a storm in the way? Who is helping them? Jesus. Jesus, in the same way. So when we hear the word of God in the direction that God has for us, we can trust that God will help us through. Amen? 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 Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we, we pray, Lord, that we would trust you, Lord. Same way we, we know already that, Lord, about trusting our dads, trusting that they would take care of us, that we would um, trust in you like that. And I pray, Lord, for the adults here, that we would learn from the children, Lord, how to trust in you, how to believe in your promises. Because sometimes we don't. Sometimes we forget, Lord. Help us with that. In Jesus' name, amen. May God bless you. I'm going to tell you a, li a little bit about our story as a denomination, a BPC. Uh, in 1923, there was a great apostasy in America. You know, there was a denomination that 10% of the ministers signed an affirmation. And that affirmation said that they could declare openly that these five basic teachings of the scriptures were not true or they were just theories. I want you to hear what these five principles or five doctrines of the scriptures are that this, this group of ministers is not our denomination. It was before our denomination was created. So they believed that they could be a minister of the word and you, you could believe that it was a theory, the inspiration of the scriptures, the deity of Christ, the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, the miracles of Jesus, the second coming of Jesus. You can be a pastor, a minister, and think that this is just theory. So a great apostasy, liberalism came to a country, and a group of pastors said, no, no, that's not right. We, if you lose just one of these fundamentals, you lose Christianity, Amen. right? Amen. So they said no to that. And in 1937, uh, we, we have what we, we call the Bible Presbyterian Church now, um, but many other pastors left their own denominations because that apostasy was coming into the country. The New Testament here is, is full of miracles of Jesus. Full, right? We just, we're going through Mark and we're, we're seeing almost every sermon we see Jesus doing these miracle things all the way. They don't happen um, all the time in the scriptures though. We might think that miracles are happening all the time. No, in the Old Testament we have Moses, right? Red Sea opens. We have um, Elijah. And then we have the New Testament. Jesus is establishing the kingdom of God. And he's saying the time has come. The kingdom of God is here. And also the fourth period, let's say, was the apostles bringing the word of the gospel. They happen. Because God wants to authenticate his prophets. God wants to say that, hey, you should listen to this person, right? 
He said to Pharaoh, you should listen to Moses. Look what he's doing. Then you see all the miracles. The same with uh, Elijah, the same with Jesus. And miracles here, they are foundational for our faith. If Jesus' miracles were not true, if they were just theory, we wouldn't have the scriptures. We wouldn't believe the Bible. So, for Jesus, the miracles of Jesus, it confirms that he is the Christ, that Jesus is God. And his death on the cross, and therefore his death on the cross would be what? Would be powerful enough to pay for our sins. They are foundational for our faith. Miracles that were registered in the scriptures. Well, we might ask, what about miracles today? Do we need them to believe? Because some skeptics say, oh, if you, if you believe in Jesus, show me a miracle. If you're a Christian, you tell me you're a Christian. I want to see, I want proof. Do we need that today? And the answer is no. Why is that? Because we have the sufficient word of God. The word of God is sufficient and faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. So, I don't know if you know this, but Jesus did more miracles than what is registered here, right? It, he did much more than that. In John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31, John says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that, the purpose here, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So, the purpose of the miracles that we have here in the scriptures is that we may believe in Jesus. We believe that he is the son of God. We're not denying that miracles may happen today. I want to affirm that. Jesus is God. He's powerful to perform miracles today. What I'm saying is that they are not the foundation for our faith. Because the miracles that served for us to believe in Jesus as the Son of God are written and registers in the Scriptures. You see? That's what the Apostle John said in his Gospel. The Bible does not say, give us today our daily miracle. The Bible says, give us today our daily bread. So many are deceived by that. And they're looking for new miracles every day. But the miracles for our salvation are here. And they're not theories. They are historical events that happen. So here we come to this text in Mark's gospel. This, in the narrative of Mark, it's a different miracle. Because all the time Jesus was healing lepers. He was healing, uh, delivering uh, demon-possessed, blind, withered hand. All these kinds of miracles. But now... He's speaking to the wind. He's speaking to this inanimate matter thing, and, and, and it is responding to him. This is another text that shows Jesus proclaiming to the world, I am God. Jesus' authority over the wind and the sea shows that he's God and also that we should trust him. Many would use this text to say, Jesus wants to calm the storms of your life. When the storms of doubt come, when the storms of financial problems come, and they would allegorize in that way. And I don't believe that this is what this text is saying, even though it's true that God calms the storms of our lives, isn't it? He does that. Through the gospel, through the word, 
through his presence, his Holy Spirit in us. But the point of this text is not that Jesus' goal is to calm whatever you're going through so you feel good about yourself. So you, you would say then, okay, Jesus called my, the, the, the trials in my life and now I can serve him. Now he's worthy of my service, right? That is not the point. We don't demand from Jesus. He is the Lord. You know what we do to him? We submit. We submit in faith and trust him. So what is beautiful here in chapter 4, the way that chapter 4 is forged is that we start with the parables. The parable of the sower, this theory, these stories of Jesus. And then we have three more parables. The light, the hidden light, the seed. Now Jesus comes from theory. He tells them all the principles. Now let's go to practice. Let's put these theories into practice, right? This is what a good teacher does. You don't teach your kid how to ride a bike, showing them videos on YouTube about that. I mean, you might show them, you might learn some of the techniques, but if you don't step on the bike and ride it, you will never learn. Same with an instrument that you play, same with ride horses, same with any ability or skill that you might ha may have. So listening is very different than experiencing. And what we want to be is a kind of church that understands the gospel in a way that the gospel is so compelling that it transforms the way that we live and it, it comes alive in our actions. And we, we have what First Peter says, the world will see your good actions and they will glorify God as we proclaim him and as we live according to his will. So it's only when we go through a practical lesson that we are able to see the limits of our resources. I remember when I was learning English, I was 15 years old, and there was no methodology. There was a lot of books written about learning English, but I only learned when I started to speak. It's when you speak. If you're gonna learn Portuguese and say more words than obrigado, right? You have to train and practice and repeat and try to pronounce, and your, your face will start to exercise. You know, for Brazilians, the TH sounds very difficult, so we, we stand in front of a mirror doing th 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 all the time, right? Thousand thing, thing, it's never thing, it's thing. It's a, a mess sometimes, but we gotta repeat. Why do we have to renew our minds every day? We're doing that. This is our sanctification process. The Word of God feeds our souls, and we're able to go through whatever we go, whatever we do in life. The question, <clears throat> sorry, the question in the end of our text is that they, they, make, they ask this question, who is this man? That is the title of our sermon, right? But if you pay attention to the text, you will see Mark, and it's only Mark, Mark writes three times the word great. It's mega, mega lay in, English, in Greek, so mega. We have this idea of great. It's a great windstorm, it's a great calm, and it's a great fear. Great windstorm, a great calm after the windstorm, in a great fear after the calm. So the first part is, who is this man? We'll say that he is a man in a great storm. Verses 35 through 38. Look at verse 35. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. It was the same day of the parable of the sowers, these three parables that we saw. Jesus was extremely tired. He was exhausted. 
Remember that he could not even eat sometime, that his parents, his family came and said, Jesus, you have to come with us. You're getting crazy. You got to stop and rest. And Jesus was extremely tired. He needed to rest as a man. It was a long day of teaching, of healing. But in verse 36, we see that they don't give him a break. It says other boats were with him, right? They were following him around. Jesus tried to, quote, unquote, right? he tried to escape the crowds, but they go and follow him anyway. They want the, they want the healing. They want the, thank you. They want the healing. They want food. They want that. So, in verses 36 and 30, 35 and 36, here we see the part of the story before the storm comes. And let me tell you something. Before the storm comes, Jesus tells them, let's go to the other side, right? What should be their answer? We just saw here with the kids. Like when a dad tells them, we're going to Walmart. What's happening? We're going to Walmart. Never a kid doubts or questions. You know, I don't know if we're going to get there, there. Do we have enough gas? You know, do, do you know the tires are okay? Kid doesn't care about those things. They just know. Not because they understand all the techniques, how an engine works to take them there, or how's the weather, what's the weather like, or, or things about that. They know because they know they're dead. This is a great exhortation for us adults here in the room when it comes to God. Because we want control. We want to take care of our own lives. Or what we hear a lot, we want to mind our own business, right? I don't care what you do. I just want to take care of my life, do, do my thing, do your thing, we're cool, and that's it. But when it comes to our faith in Christ, we are to remember what he told us. Let us go to the other side. But then... Jesus, Jesus says that we're going to the other side. So one important thing to, to remember is that when Jesus promises something, this is reality. This is not a possibility. Okay? Because Jesus is the one who creates things by saying them. We're not like that. We're not like that. And some preaching in other uh, some other kind of preaching say that if you repeat a lot, it will come to you. You will attract, right? It's the law of attraction. You'll say money, 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 and then you'll be rich. So every day you look in the mirror and say, you're going to be rich. You're going to be fabulous. You're going to lose 30 pounds this week. And then this will come to you. The law of attraction. Is this what... The Bible teaches about us being the image of God. We were made in the image of God, but we're not as powerful as God. We're limited. And God is the only one who speaks things into being. He says, let there be light, and there is light instantly, because he has that authority. You know, the presence of Jesus on that boat should be their assurance of, we're going to get there. Jesus in Colossians, Paul says, Colossians 1, 15 through 17, he says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He sustains the universe. That is the man who told his disciples, let us go to the other side. Let us go to the other side. The universe bows to his will. 
Can you see that? So verse 37, you see that in the area of Galilee, it's, Galilee is not a sea, even though they call it Sea of Galilee, it's, it's a big lake, and it's surrounded by mountains, and sometimes the wind comes and makes a great storm, but it gets them by surprise most of the time. And the, the, the word here, that a, a great windstorm arose and the waves were breaking into the boat, the verb it's used is the, the idea like a monster attacking. It, it's horrible. This group of experienced fishermen, they were terrified. I mean, that's a good reason to be afraid, right? If you're around a group of uh, experienced fishermen and they're afraid, you should be afraid because that's bad. So in verse 38, we see that Jesus was lying on a cushion. It was common to have that cushion that they used to stir in the, the boats. Every boat had one, and Jesus just took that. He was tired. He was laying there in the back of the boat in the stern. They look at the storm. They are afraid, and they look at Jesus sleeping, and they, they ask him, and the, the account of Mark is, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Do you not care? The, the Matthew account is, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. Luke says, Master, Master, we are perishing. But Mark uses this question, Do you not care that we are perishing? Why were they in such despair? Why were they so afraid? I think the first reason is that they don't understand the storm. You know, when um, Prophet Jonah was in a boat and there was a great storm, it's easy for us to understand. He was in disobedience to God, right? God used the storm so the sailors would throw him in, into the sea. So it makes sense. But the disciples... They were with Jesus on the boat. There should be no storm, right? There should be no storm because Jesus is there. I mean, that's Christian life. When you're Christian, you believe in Jesus, you no longer have problems. You say amen, right? Yeah. Isn't that true? No, it's not. Whoever sold you this idea of a, a Christianity without problems, without Life trials, it's not true. But when you see this urgent need of the disciples, they were afraid. And you see this apparent annoying rest of Jesus, right? It bothers us, right? Jesus, don't you see what's going on here? Just sleeping on a pill in peace. Remember when, when Lazarus died and Martha was like, Lord, if you were here, he would be alive? They had a belief that the Pharisees, they had a belief that if a person dies, you have three days. In three days, you can still bring them back. But the fourth day, that's it. He'll be dead forever. And Jesus intentionally gets there when? Fourth day. What is Jesus saying? I'm doing things that only God can do. It is a clear message about Jesus' divinity, Jesus' power and glory. And it's the same thing here in this text. They don't understand why Jesus is resting. They don't understand why Jesus is silent. When, when they wake Jesus up, Jesus doesn't talk to them first in the first place. I remember when, when Job was going through such a, a hard time in his life, and he says, why, God? Why am I suffering? I'm being faithful. Why are my children dead? Why I lost everything? Why is my wife asking me to curse you and die? What's going on? You know what God answers? Nothing. He doesn't need to answer you anything or me. He is God. You know what our attitude should be? 
trusting, relying on him. Because as we just had read, he is the one who holds everything together. So if we are alive, we have a reason to thank him. We have a reason to praise him. It's his mercy that we get to live another day. But they are, they are so, so afraid. They're anxious. They're worried that they're going to die. And Jesus doesn't do anything about that. I, I want to share this with you as an application. But I want you to know that I don't think this is, what, this is the case for everyone. But I, I want to say that for many Christians... Many Christians who live in anxiety, who live in anguish in their hearts, it's because they don't invest in their spiritual disciplines. Psalm 1, 1 and 2 said, Blessed is the man, blessed is the man who has a delight in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night, meditates in the word. Meditation is not to sit in front of the word with the word open doing, mm, no. Meditate is like a, a cow eats the food. You eat, and a cow, I think, has four stomachs, so swallows, and then brings back the food and keeps chewing, you know, and then puts back. I know it's, it's not a beautiful picture, but the idea is, is going back and, and you know, Going back and learning and going back and we need to do that, dear, dear brothers and sisters. We need to hear the gospel again and again and again and again. We need that. Let us repent from any kind of spiritual laziness that we may have. Because when it's a, a, a game on TV or when it's a movie that we like, we don't even see the time passing by. But for the word, many times we just, we're too tired, right? The more we practice that, you know what we happen? The more confidence we have in the Lord. Amen. You know what's happening when we're going through a trial, and then we are reminded, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall lack, lack nothing. I, I don't need anything else because I have everything I need. The Lord is my shepherd. So we keep asking this question when we look at this text, who is that man? Jesus is this man that brings a great calm. Look at verse 39 and 40. Jesus answers them by calming the storms. He says, peace, be still. I've tried doing that, you know, with the rain here in Florida. Peace, be still, but they did not listen to me. It rains a lot here in the summer. Sometimes I want to play with my kids outside, but nope, doesn't work. It's, I think the disciples, they are impressed. They, they don't, they didn't know that he could do that. <laughs> oh, is that a new trick? Is it a new superpower? Peace, be still. And what is the only possible answer for Jesus, who is God, the only possible answer to happen there is what the text says, a great calm. A great calm. It's not just calm, calm. It's a great calm. And one side note to that, remember that boats followed him? They didn't have Jesus on their boats. So they see the storm happening. They are afraid too. If the fishermen in Jesus' boat, they were afraid, all of them were. And out of the sudden, calm. They don't know who did it or what happened. It just did. But the disciples, they knew who did it. The disciples, they had this special revelation of this miracle. 
Isn't that the exact same thing that we just learned in chapter 4? That to the crowd, Jesus would speak in parables. But to his disciples, he would explain why he would do things. I find that interesting. To them, they know the reason. They know who did it. But verse 40, Jesus exhorts them. Have you still no faith? Haven't you seen enough to believe that I am God? Haven't you experienced enough? Well, in the disciples' defense, they had some kind of faith, right? Because they woke him up. They said, Jesus, wake up. But Jesus was asking that question because they were anxious about it. Jesus' peace bothered the disciples. Jesus knew about the storm. But let me tell you something. Peace is not the absence of storm. Peace is knowing that everything is in Jesus' control. It's a great difference. Because when we're in the midst of chaos, we know and we're able to lie down and take a nap. Jesus is in control. Nothing escapes from his mighty hands. Jesus is powerful even to speak to the wind, and they obey him. I, I remember playing soccer with a friend a few years ago. And by the way, we had the, the fellowship on Monday. I was able to play seven minutes. That's a personal record, right? So my kids were like, let's play again, let's do it again. It's like, oh, I'm going to have some water, and then we'll see <laughs> if I survive. But we played a little bit, and uh, this friend fell, and he dislocated his shoulder. You know, the pain and the, the screaming, it was like, ah, oh, and you see that ugly picture of a shoulder here in the back. And one of the, the friends in the group, he was a doctor. He said, okay, I got I to gotta do something here. I'm going to pull your arm and put it back in place. Oh, man, this guy, when he pulled him, he screamed, but he was like, ah, oh, whoa, it's better. This picture of a great level of pain, and then you put back into place, and you go from a pain number 10 to a 2. When it's 2, it's like, oh, I wasn't 10. It's fine, you know? And this, everybody looks at him, like, oh, no, it's fine. And then he just wraps his arm for a week or so, or four days, and he's fine. This transition of a great loud noise and this great calm and peace it's when you see those little cute videos of babies crying for the phone or for the toy, and they're crying, and you give them the toys, so they're happy. Now everything's blue, is it colorful again? But what, what, kind of, what kind of life do we have to live in order to believe God when we are in great pain and when we are in great calm? Because I think this is the hardest place to be when it comes to Christian life, isn't it? Paul in Philippians chapter 4, he says, I know how to live in abundance and to lack. But you know, all things, I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. He doesn't care if he has or he has not. I think it's difficult. It's easy to complain when you don't have things. But it's so difficult um, to worship him when you don't have things. To praise his name. To say that he is God. God, why didn't you save my daughter? Or why didn't you save my son? It's easy when you have all your children serving the Lord and obey him. But then when you have one that's not, it's like, oh, I preached to them, God. I did this. I did that. Do we trust him with our lives? What kind of peace is that the gospel offer us? What kind of peace that, that makes, like in Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas in prison. They were in, in, in jail, handcuffs. They were beaten. And you know what they're doing midnight? They're praying to God and singing hymns. 
They're like we were on Monday, eating picanha and playing soccer and playing volleyball. But they had all this blood on their back, all this pain for being there unjustly. And they are exalting the name of God, saying, God save us. What a blessing it is. How can we have that peace? Paul said in Philippians 3, I counted everything that I had as loss for the sake of Christ. He said that I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. This is the chapter, Philippians 3, that he gives his resume. All these great things that he accomplished as a rabbi, as a Roman citizen, and everything. He said, I count them as rubbish. Why? That I may know Jesus, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings. Become like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Acts 20, 24, he says, But I do not account my life of any value nor is precious to myself. If only I may finish my course in the ministry that I have received from the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. How can we have the peace of the gospel that gives us joy in the midst of suffering? How can we read that, James 1, and not sound a crazy person? James said, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and the steadfastness have it, its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. What kind of peace is that that makes Paul, in the end of his life, one of the greatest apostles ever to write almost two-thirds of the New Testament, say, at my first hearing, no one showed up. Actually, the guy that I thought was going to help me, he stood against me. But he said, but the Lord stood by me and strengthened me so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely to, into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever. Amen. It is a peace that is surpassing human understanding. It is a kind of life that people question. How can you praise God if you're going through such a horrible things in your life? How can Paul write the Philippians again from prison and say, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. <laughs> There's a guy in prison helping free Christian brothers to rejoice in the Lord. It's only through the power of the gospel. How can we have that? Because I'm, I'm speaking, I'm giving you very, very uh, uh, many examples of apostles, preachers, right? These are holy men, right? Well, we can have that by working and resting. By working out our salvation working our holiness before God and resting in the power of the gospel that is only through the Holy Spirit that we can be transformed. It's only through the power of Jesus. So after this great calm, everything's calm now. No waves, no rain, no sound. They're all amazed by Jesus. What comes next is a great fear. As Jews in the narrative, as Jews in our text today, 
they knew that only God, only God would have authority over the sea. Remember Exodus? God told me, you know, raise your staff and see open. And then when Pharaoh passed with his army, God closed. It's God controlling nature for his glory. Psalm 93, 4, it says, Mighty, Mightier than the thunders of many waters, mightier than the waves of the sea, the Lord on high is mighty. Psalm 89, 9, You rule the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. So after seeing what Jesus did and knowing what they knew about God, the only possible answer is submission, is reverence. All, they marveled at the power of Jesus. Why? Okay, because they, they realized that Jesus is no ordinary man. He's a different one, other than us. He's different. He is holy. One of the definitions of holy is that perfect and also different from. Jesus is that. This is exactly what we see throughout the scriptures. Every time a human, mortal, fragile, sinner man encounters the presence of the holy, they fear, they bow, they tremble. That's what they're doing here. Jesus is God. The disciples, they were slow to see that. They only had this full revelation after the resurrection. Isaiah chapter 6, the prophet gets in the presence of God. And the angels, cherubims and seraphims, they say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Peter, when he experiences the miracle of the, the, the great fishing, he kneels before Jesus and says, Away from me, I'm a sinner. What should you do, what should I do when we encounter Jesus? Surrender, worship, bow before his power, worship his name. Who is this man? Who is this man? This man is no ordinary man. This man is God. He's the one who was in the beginning with God. And through him, all things were created. He's the one who holds everything together. I know that liberal theology wants to portray Jesus just as this historic figure that was a, a good prophet. He has good teachings for us. And it's easy for the world to accept Jesus as long as you don't have to define who Jesus is. When we get to the definition of who Jesus is, that's when we get trouble, right? If you say that Jesus was this historic man, a prophet, a good man, you're good, you're accepted. But if you say that he is God and every knee shall bow before him, and you, you're called to repent before him, then you have a problem. Because if you repent and find grace, you go to heaven. But if you don't, you're going to be condemned. And this is not a nice word for today. Condemnation. So, why do they want to get to the other side? And why is that, uh, that story important for us? We see all the time the divinity of Jesus, the importance of who Jesus is. That should not drive us away from him, but should draw us near him in repentance, bowing to his presence and worshiping his name. And this is what we're doing now. We're going to sing a song called Behold Our God. 
And this is, this is the one that we're singing about. Amen. It's in the back of your bulletin. I invite the musicians to come. I'm going to pray. And then we're going to sing. Please let's stand. Lord, thank you so much for your grace. Thank you so much, Lord, that we, we get to see that you are God. We get to worship you this morning. Thank you for your grace. I pray, Lord, that as we hear the gospel, may we be compelled by your spirit and transformed into a new person. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen.